So gang, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you like what you see. I hope you hope you I hope you like what you're seeing and you decide to stay by clicking the subscribe button. Road to 1k subscribers, baby. So in today's video, I'm just going to be doing a summary video of discrete and continuous distributions, right? So let me just explain what what these two mean. So um, remember in chapter one, two, three, before we got to probability, we were talking about samples, right? What is a sample? It's when you are taking a portion of the whole population and you are making conclusions based on the sample, right? So you're not looking at the whole population. You're looking at a portion of the population, right? And the outcomes that you find from the sample, we call those outcomes sample statistics, right? But now we are interested in knowing what happens then to the whole population, right? How can I then analyze data of the whole population, right? So that's what we are going to be discussing in today's video. But before we do that, let's explain what a random variable is. So a random variable is a function, right? Any function has x and it has y. Any basic function has x and it has y. Every x value corresponds to a unique y value right so that's what that's how a random variable normally works it's just that with the random variable we are assuming a value right we are assuming a value an x value as a result of an experiment so there was a certain experiment that occurred so based on that experiment outcomes we are assuming a value right as a result of that experiment and we are relating it to a unique value so we are saying that let's just say for example one is um is is is, is related to 0 0.5 right so we are relating the x value of one to a, a y value or a probability of 0 0.5 right but where did we get the one the one came from the experiment right so that's what a random variable is it is a function and it has x and y basically okay so what type of random variables do we have we have two types of random variables discrete and continuous Think of discrete as people, as, okay, think of discrete as objects. You, can, you cannot have one and a half person. You can have one person, two people, three people, four people, five people, right? You can't have one and a half laptops, one and a half books, right? You can have one book, two books, three books, four books. So in the discrete variables, we are counting, right? We have one iron, right? We have one phone, two phone, three phones, right? one t-shirt so we are counting items we are counting items they cannot have decimals right so i like to think of discrete data as whole numbers right you will only find whole numbers under discrete because you cannot have one comma three of a person right you can only have one person no matter how small the child is you can never say it's a half person right it's a full person it's it's one person so yes and then we have continuous. So with continuous, we are not necessarily counting, but we are rather measuring, right? We're talking about things like time. You can have one and a half hours. You can have 3,7 hours, right? So with, with continuous, we are counting, we're measuring. You can have 1,5 centimeters, right? You could have run 12,5 kilometers. So with the continuous one, we are counting. Think of continuous as having decimals in your numbers right so as i said random variables are functions right and we have two types of those discrete and continuous discrete whole numbers continuous you have decimals right and then under discrete so what happens is normally on a very normal case we have x values and they are assigned to the probabilities and when you add the probabilities they give you one right and each probability is between zero and one with the discrete one right and in such a case it's a very easy case in order to calculate our parameters we, in order to find the outcomes and to analyze the data we can use a probability mass function so we just end at this step but sometimes we do not know the experiment right so when we do not know the experiment what do we then proceed to use we proceed to use distributions what does distribution mean it, it's telling us how the data is spread right how how the whole population is spread right so Yes, so we have two types of distributions, binomial and Poisson, right? So I'm going to be um, working on those, but all I can say is that with the binomial one, you only have two outcomes. It can either be a success or a failure. 
And for the binomial one, x um, ends, right? It's not ongoing. It's not infinite, right? doesn't approach infinity. With the binomial one, you could be starting at 1 all the way to 4. But with the Poisson one, you're not, only, you're not necessarily dealing with two events only, but the most important factor of the Poisson distribution is that you think things are occurring at a constant rate, right? And we denote that rate as lambda, right? So we denote that rate as lambda, and things are occurring at a constant rate. However, your x starts wherever it starts, and it could be starting at 0 or at 1, and it goes on and on and on and on and on, and it does not stop. For example, for the Poisson one, we look at things like the number of customers that arrive at a store. You can't say that, like, you can't, pre for example, you predict in the morning and you're trying to predict the number of customers that are going to come into the shop. They are going to, in, like, infinitely come um, to your shop. So N does not end, unlike with the binomial one. With the binomial one, you can have N starting from 1 to 5. With the Poisson one, you have N starting at 1, but never ending. So it goes on and on, right? Then we come to the second random variable, continuous one. We have the exponential distribution, and then we have the normal distribution. Excuse me. And in this video, I'm just going to be focusing on these three, binomial, Poisson, and exponential. And then I'm going to be making a video on counting principles. So please make sure you have subscribed so that you don't miss out. Make sure you've liked this video. Make sure you've commented in the comment section below. Okay, let's get right into the content. So as I said, sometimes you are given an X value and a probability, right? And when you analyze what you are given, you find that each probability is between zero and one. For example, if I analyze this, this, this whole thing, my X corresponds to a probability of one over four. And that gives me 0, 0,25, right? 0, 0,25 is between zero and one. Okay, first box ticks, ticked. The second box that you need to tick in order to use the probability mass function is that when you add all the probabilities, they need to give you one. So if you add all these probabilities, they give you one. So if those two cases are met, right, if those, if those two requirements are met, first of all, each probability must be between zero and one. Secondly, when you add all the probabilities, they give you one. Then we say that this X and its corresponding probabilities define what we call a probability mass function. So, yeah. That's just, that's just what we are saying. Okay, so let us look at what happens. So you are at a, at a point, where it's at a state where you have defined that a probability mass function has been defined, right? So then what do you do next? There are three things that you need to know, three formulas that you need to know. Okay, the first one is that for any probability, right? So remember I said the, it's a probability mass function, it has function. So it means that you have an X and you have an outcome for that. So for a probability mass function, any value that is defined as um, capital letter X, for example, this could be one, it is equal to their probability. So they are saying any X value is equal to their, their probability. So you could have um, probability of X is equal to one, and you would have to go back to your table and see what probability um, corresponds to that. For example, in this case, it's one over four. So we would say that e.g. p of x is equal to 1, is equal to its probability, which is 1 over 4, right? Easy, right? Okay, and then the second thing that you need to know is the expected value of x. The expected value of x tells us about the mean, right? What is the expectation of the data that I have? What is the expectation of my parameters, right? And that translates to the mean, right? And to calculate the mean, what you do is that you multiply, you find the product of each x value and its corresponding probability, and then you sum the values. So for example, in, in, in this example that I have here, you have one of one, two, three, with their corresponding probabilities of one over three. So what are they saying? Multiply the x as well as its probabilities. So you're gonna say one times one over three, then you add, because this is a summation sign plus two times one over three, plus three times one over three, right? And you should get a two, two, right? So we are saying that the, the expected value, the mean is two, right? Just follow your formula. And then with the variance, right? We are saying that you are actually squaring the X values and multiplying each X value with its pro, um, corresponding probabilities. So what they are saying is that I should square the X values. So where there's a one, where there's an x, I square, right? So there was a 1, so I squared the 1. 
there was a 2. I squared the 2. I leave the, the, the P of X as it is because there's no square here, right? Then there's a 3. So I square the 3, right? And then I should get this answer. However, I'm not done here. What do I now need to do? I need to now subtract, right? What I had found here squared. I had found a 2. So I'm going to subtract a 2 squared, right? And this is the variance that you get 2 over 3. Okay, and then we have what we call a standard deviation. Standard deviation is um, basically the square root of your variance, right? So, for example, here my variance is 2 over 3. So, if I want the standard deviation, I'm just going to say the square root of 2 over 3, then you get 0, 0,8164, right? I hope that helps. So, as I was saying, um, in, in, in such easy cases where we're just given x value that corresponds to its probability, right? and it meets the criteria of a probability mass function, we can use the probability mass function this, do these easy calculations. But sometimes it's not as easy as it seems. Sometimes we do not know the experiment. We don't know the exact experiment. So in such a case, we need to use um, the distribution of the data, the distribution of how my population is, right? And the first distribution that we look at is the binomial distribution, right? So there are two things that need to conform First of all, you need to have n identical childs. So if you are throwing a ball in the first child, you need to also throw a ball, the very same ball, in the second child. So you need to have n identical childs. For example, you might have five accounts, right? And the accounts can either be debit or credit, right? So you have five accounts, n identical childs. They are all accounts. Secondly, they need to generate only two possible outcomes. And we call those outcomes a success or a failure. Success does not, does not necessarily mean a good thing. Success means what are, you ex, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? If you're focusing on the debit accounts, the success would be the debits. If you're focusing on the credit accounts, the success may be the credits, right? So the success is basically what you are focusing on, right? So let's look at the example of accounts. You have five accounts. So first tick, done, right? So you have N identical charts. For this one, remember, you only had like one, um, child, you had X's and probabilities. They're not talking about different accounts. They're not talking about throwing five balls or whatever, right? So on this one, you have different childs. You have N identical childs. Secondly, they can only generate two possible outcomes, a success or a failure. As I said, let's look at the um, five accounts that can either be debit or credits. So N is equal to five identical accounts, right? So N is five. And then secondly, it needs to generate two um, outcomes, either a success or a failure, you can only have a debit or a credit. So that would meet the criteria of a binomial distribution. After you have checked these two things, you now define it like this. You say that X follows, X is what we are focusing on. So if we are focusing on debit accounts, you would say X, you would define X as the number of debit accounts. If you are, de if you are looking at credits, am I speaking too fast? I'm so sorry. If you are looking at credits, then you would define X as the number of credit of accounts with the credits, right? So you say X follows, this means follows. So you say X follows a binomial distribution, right? Where you have N being the number of ident identical childs and the probability of that. So they might tell you that the probability of getting um, a debit is 75%, right? So you would be you would be like, if you, if you define your X as debits, you'd have five, um, the sign 0, 0,75, right? So that's what they are saying. So as I said, N being the number of trials that you have, P being the probability of the defined X, very important, because we have debits and credits. So if you define your debits as X, right? If you're looking at debits, if you're focusing on debits, then it needs to be the probability of your debits, can be the probability of your credits, right? And then if you're looking at credits, then... Um, your probability needs to be for credits, right? And then this formula is in your formula sheets. And as I said, with the um, with the binomial one, our our n ends, right? So you, your x can start at 0, 1, 2, all the way to n. So it's not continuous, right? It does not go to infinity. It ends at some point in time, right? And this is the formula that you have, and it's given in your formula sheets. So all you have to do is to follow these formulas, right? Okay. And then we have the last distribution for our discrete data, discrete random variable, and we call it the Poisson distribution. So unlike the binomial, and together with the binomial, you have two, you have n identical childs, and they can have only two outcomes, right? And most importantly, with the binomial one, our n 
ends, right? So n could be ending at 5. Our x could be ending at 5. However, with the Poisson distribution, there are two characteristics that you need to know. First of all, which is the one that um, makes a distinction between our binomial and our Poisson, it is the fact that n that x does not end. So it, it does not end. It doesn't end at n. It ends at infinity, right? So x approaches infinity, right? So, yeah, x approaches infinity, but most importantly, right, the second criteria, first of all, n approaches infinity, I mean, x approaches infinity, so there's no defined n, as I, as I drew here, 0, 1, 2, we don't know where it's ending. We don't know the number of customers that might come into your business, right? Secondly, um, you are moving at a, const at a constant rate, so there's a constant rates at which you are moving, right? And that constant rate is denoted by lambda. So they might be telling you that customers arrive um, three times a day. So that means your lambda will be three because they, 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 they arrive three times, right? The rate at which they are, the rate at which something is occurring in that rate is constant, right? So whenever you have those things, you define X, right? Which is what you are focusing at. You say X follows a Poisson, a Poisson distribution that are given your lambda. So whatever the rates of occurrence is, you put it here. And then you will do this, right? So um, I'll do a video applying this. Don't worry about it. But now you just need to understand the basics, which we're not a lot. But before I, I, I go ahead um, with this, there's a factorial sign here. So I just want to show you guys where the factorial is. I'm just using this casual calculator. I haven't checked the other one, right? So, for example, if there's two factorial, so you press your two, shift, this sign, right? It's x to the power of minus one. You've already said shift, so you want this factorial here. So, two factorial. Let's just say you are looking at a combination. I want to confuse people. Let me look at how to use the calculation combinations on your counting principles video. So, thank you so much for watching. That will be it for today's video. I'll do a separate video for... Um, the exponential one but in that video i'm going to also be applying the um, poisson one and the binomial one so i hope this helped and i hope this summarized and knotted everything together so good luck for your test um please don't forget to comment like and subscribe and please don't forget to ask your family members to subscribe and tell them to tell their friends to tell their friends and tell their friends and tell their friends to subscribe to my channel so so that we grow road to 1k subscribers then 10k then 100k okay thank you so much for watching guys bye